All right, what I'm about to read is what's been on my heart this past year, so um, so here I go. I came to know the Lord when I was a small boy. I was about five or six. Every night, my father at bedtime would kneel with me beside the bed, bed praying and telling me who Jesus was and how much he loved me. He would read John 3 with me. Now, one night, I opened my heart to Christ, asking him to come into my life. Not long after that night, I received my first Bible from a brother in Christ. I grew up in a conservative Christian church setting. P Plymouth Brethren is the official name, or a New Testament assembly. The meaning is based off of Acts 2.42, the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking of Bread, and in Prayer. As a young Christian, I enjoyed learning from older people, just listening to their stories how God worked in their life. We all go through trials and sufferings, but God uses it for his glory, God's glory. So this is my story. I was married once before to someone I thought was a Christian. I started a family until one day I came home from work. There was a note on the door saying she left me for someone else. She took my son with her at the time. Not knowing where your kid is at is the worst thing a parent can go through. But by God's grace, I was able to have full custody of David. During this hard time, I would remember Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. I never questioned God during this hard time, but knew there was a reason for it, but didn't know what it was. It was God's plan. With the help and encouragement of family and church family, including my neighbor, Cindy, I was able to stay strong in faith, the word of God. Several years later, I was praying for David to have a mom. I was talking to a close Christian friend of mine who met his wife on eHarmony and suggested trying it. So I tried it. After a year with not having much luck, I got off of it. After a month later, something was telling me not to give up, to get back on it, so I did. Soon after, I met my future wife, Karen. Before we had a serious conversation, I decided to give her a test to see if she is a true believer. <laughs> I asked her to read Ephesians 5.22 and 5.25 and asked what it meant to her. After receiving a long reply back, I knew that the Holy Spirit was working with her in her answer. She knows and understands submission by God's word. But I wasn't done yet. I asked her to read Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7, and explain how it applies today to raising children. She hit the nail on the head with her answer about raising children in God's eyes. After that, I felt comfortable in pursuing a relationship with her. We started talking to each other, and I realized she went through the same experience of being left for, for another person. Karen understood my past. She was able to help me let go of my frustration, anger, and to forgive. We got married this past June. Karen's adoption for David has recently been finalized. David received his new birth certificate right before Christmas, which is important to him. He has it hanging on his bedroom wall. Now he has a mom I've been praying for. Karen has been a huge blessing in my life as well as David's life. We all suffer at times through heartbreak, tragedies, disappointments, frustrations, and wonder what good can come out of it. I have been given a glimpse of the good God has done for me that he promised in Romans 8.28. I thank him each and every day for the many blessings he has given me and my family. And I remember that my life is controlled by a wonderful, personal Lord Jesus Christ. As one of my favorite hymns written by Fanny Crosby, to God be the glory, great things he has done. That's a good way to start up a new year. Amen. Yeah. Plus newlyweds. That's a good story, too. Uh, we'll have uh, Karen in the near future, who probably will give us a little insight on that and uh, the quizzing that she had. That was a good start. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father in heaven, we come before you to, right now at this moment as we stand in January 1, 2017. Father, we've just come through a year that uh, many people have reported as being one of the roughest years of their life, both those who know you and those who do not. And it's been very interesting. Very interesting to see what those things were that troubled them greatly. Things that brought grief and pain, tears, heartbreak, disappointment, anger, anxiety. And now, on January 1, 2017, I ask you to give us insight in the God who, into the God who works all things after the counsel of his will. Where you're going, what you're doing, so that we can join you. I pray that this moment, for this time, for this assembly and everyone individually. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's see. <clears throat> it is um, Oh, what we got? There it is. It is uh, 2017 and um, we're standing here. And what should we talk about? Any suggestions? You said, Pastor, you better have an idea by this point in time, right? Pardon me? Jesus, amen. I, I think we should do that. Okay? We should do that. Where is leaving us? I like that direction. So, um, Let's talk about vision. You know, there's a very important passage in the scriptures, in the Book of Wisdom. As a matter of fact, if you have just received or are receiving one of these with the outline on the back, there's a verse, that very verse that's recorded at the bottom. Where there is no vision, the people are discouraged. The word in the King James is translated perish, they are throwing off, throwing off so that they're uncovered and they're left uncovered where there is no vision. As a matter of fact, some quite frankly just translate it, they're naked because they've thrown off, they've had thrown off for them any covering where there is no vision. And, of course, it is a vision from God that he's talking about there. But happy are those who have a direction and they follow that. Specifically, the translation says, who keep the law. So this morning, um, I'm going to have you covered. You're going to be covered by God with vision. A vision from God. A vision for God for us individually and for the body together. So, question. Are there any objections to that this morning? Those who are for it, those who are against it? Even if there were, I was going to do it. But I just thought I'd bring it up to give you your opportunity. So we're going to talk about vision, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it from First Peter chapter four and verse eleven. Will you turn there with me in your Bible? First Peter chapter four and verse eleven. First Peter chapter four and verse eleven is the verse that Pastor or <clears throat> that Pastor Stewart, Elder Stewart 
finished with before we had our Ice Age two weeks ago, and before we had our Christmas Eve, which kept us there on Saturday night rather than Sunday morning in fellowship. It was fun, had a couple hang-ups, but it was fun. This is a passage that he left off with. And we're going to pick it up, and we're going to use it as a springboard, the only possible springboard for a vision for the future. And I want to say this is the only possible springboard. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. We're going to pick up with a statement of purpose. Because the vision has a purpose. Last part of verse 11. In order that, it's a statement of purpose, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, and that's fitting because it's to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever, so be that, Peter says by inspiration from God. That's the way it needs to be. That he has this glory and dominion, that he stays in charge forever and ever, because that's the way it is. Amen. Now, I want you to know that that is the springboard. There is no other place that you can start. There is no other place that you can finish. Because interestingly, he says here when he talks about God's glory, God having charge or dominion, he says it like this, that it goes from the ages to the ages. And and what he gives us is a suggestion about how God handles eternity. There is an age that rolls into another age that rolls into another age. And all of these ages to ages to ages makes the whole thing of the age, the eternal. That's what he's saying. And we kind of get a picture of that when you see how God's talk about the return of Christ and his 1,000-year reign on the, on the earth, which is a vision for the future. Christ's return and 1,000 year reign on the earth, and how that age just rolls right in to the eternal age. As a matter of fact, if you've read Andy Alcorn's book on heaven, of which I know some of you have some questions on some things there, if that's okay, you don't have to agree with him on everything. As a matter of fact, I don't even agree with me on everything. Because my mind changes from one thing to another on some issues. But how that rolls, this 1,000-year reign of Christ rolls right into the eternal age and brings over characteristics there into the eternal. And that's how it goes. That the age rolls into the age and all of the ages together make up the eternal. And in that, the glory of God and his charge is going on from age to age to age to age in this age too, right now. As a matter of fact, some of the things that we know here, though they're all made renewed, they're all rejuvenated, they're regenerated, still roll over, one of them being you, if you're saved. You will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, but it will be you who's in heaven. And one age rolls to another, to another, to another, carrying these things forward, and the whole thing is God's eternal. Now, here's the point. That the thing that transcends all of that is God's glory and his dominion. It belongs to him. It belongs to him. And what Peter is calling us to here, if you look at verse 11, is that the purpose we are to have in this age 
is that we may be glorifying God through Jesus Christ in everything. Notice how he says it. Statement of purpose, in order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him it belongs. From age to age to make the ages the eternal. That's what he says. Quite interesting, isn't it? That is the springboard. The glorifying of God. That is the vision. Now, when he says that, he says it in context, the context of what Dr. Stewart covered for us the last time. Last time he covered for us verses 7 through 11. I know it's been a while ago, but that's what he covered. And there he brings out, well, look with me at verse 7. The end of all things is at hand, the present age he's talking about. The end of all things that we know in this present age is at hand. It's not very far off. Therefore, be self-controlled, be serious-minded. For what purpose? For what sake? What does he say? For the purpose of what? Look at verse 7. What is the purpose that you should be under control, controlling yourself, and have a serious mind? What's, what's the statement? For the, purpose of, for the purpose of praying. For the purpose of praying. And then he says from that purpose of praying, there are some things we should do with one another. Love one another fervently, verse 8. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another. Show hospitality. Do it without complaining or griping. Verse number 10, use the gifts, the spiritual gifts he's given to serve one another. Whether those spiritual gifts are speaking in nature or they're serving, acts of service in nature, do that. Those three one another's. And then he says, so that in all of this, you'll be glorifying God. It belongs to him. That's vision. That is the ground for the springboard that we are going to use this morning for vision, 2017. Now I want to say one other thing. When we finish this vision statement, for you individually and for us collectively as the body of Christ in heartland, I want you to know, you will have the option to choose or decline the vision. It's based on the ground of all those things he says that glorifies God. It's based on the ground of praying. It's based on the ground of loving fervently. It's based on the ground of hospitality. It's based on the ground of serving. In speaking and in acts of service. It's based on that ground with the springboard being to glorify God. But you have a choice. Because I want you to see one very important thing he says here. He says at the end of verse 11... The statement of purpose that in everything God may be glorified. Do you see that? He may and he may not. The verb that he uses here is very important because it is what's called a subjunctive verb. That means there's an option given. You can choose to go with it and glorify God. This ground and this springboard, you can choose to go with it and glorify God, or you have the option like God always provides, the option of declining the vision. So I'm setting it out to you. Straight up, straight out, vision 2017, based on the scriptures. And it's up to you. When we get to the end of this, it's up to you, and quite frankly, some will say, oh, yes, but not. And some will say, oh, yes, and do. And some will walk out and completely forget. 
It's up to you. Straight up. It's up to you. So let's do this. Let's talk about vision. What is the glory of God? It's the springboard. What is the glory of God? Well, the glory of God is uh, it's the expression of what he is as a person. That is talked about in Psalm 19.1, where it says the heavens declare the glory of God. Romans 1 says this too, that his invisible attributes, what he is as a person, is expressed through what he's created. The glory of God is declared. It's declared. It's declared. When you look at the heavens, the infinite wisdom, the beauty, the balance of this whole thing is declared. Day after day, it's the glory of God. Also, the glory of God is in his person being declared, being shown. The heavens do that, but when Moses gets really personal with the Lord and he says to God under the dressing situation, show me your glory. Show me your beauty. Show me your wisdom. Show me your brilliance. Show me your intellect. Show me your grandeur. The Lord says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And when that goodness goes by, I'm going to hide you in a rock and cover you with a hand so that when it goes by, you'll be able to see the reflection of the backside of my glory because you can't see it and live. What we get from this, the glory of God, it is the expression of the goodness of his person. Being seen, being Known, being expressed. That's the glory of God. It's what it is in itself. It's the springboard for vision. The glorifying of God is the springboard for vision. And by the way, there was one time on earth when it was clearly said that this is the glory, glory to, to God in the highest. When was that, by the way? When was that? By who? Angels. When? At the birth of Christ. This was the expression of the goodness of God. This was the highest expression of the goodness of God. When God in his person came close, real close, closer than ever before. And the angels proclaimed glory to God in the highest. Because of what he's doing, what he's showing. The beginning of vision must start here with the glory of God. It must. That's what it's all about. By the way, what is the chief, the highest end or highest aim or goal of man? Chief end of man is glorify God. And is that new with me? Is that new with you? Is that new with the 1,600 folks that were in the Westminster Assembly and wrote the confession? No. As a matter of fact, Peter is talking about it here. As a matter of fact, Isaiah talks about it when he says, God created Isaiah chapter 42, verse for his glory, glory, and throughout the Old Testament, that is the vision that goes from the ages to the ages to the ages out into forever. The glorifying of God. Now, how do we, how do we glorify God? How do we do it? I mean, can you improve on his goodness? Do you add anything to his wisdom? Can you give a better picture of how beautiful he is by showing you? How do we glorify him? How do we do it? If it's the chief end, how do we do it? Let me give you a little insight here. I, I 
looked at a book that was called an Expedition, Expositional Dictionary of Bible Words. Okay? And in that Expositional Dictionary of Bible Words, there was a statement about doxe, which is the word doxology that Dr. Stewart sang the doxology for us about. Remember that? Would you like to have him do it again? <laughs> Maybe later. The doxology talks about this expression to God. And I looked up that word, and it said this. It said that the Greek word doxe was used by the people to talk about getting an opinion and giving an opinion to others about yourself. Because you see, the Greeks sought that others would look at them for what they did and who they were and go, whoa, you know, I'm somebody. You know, I'm somebody. I'm somebody. You're talking to somebody who is somebody, okay? And they sought that, and that's the word that he picked up when he talked about what we do with God, that we spread around an opinion of his goodness. We spread around an opinion of what he is really like as a person, what God is like as a person. That's glorifying him. And Peter's statement of purpose was that in everything, in everything, God may be glorified through you. That a good opinion, an accurate opinion of who God is gets spread around by you showing what he means and what he's done in your life. Amen? That's how we glorify him with our words and with our actions and with our repentance and our change. That's how we glorify Him. Now, having said that, I want to talk about vision specifically, and I want you to know I'm going to get specific. I'm going to talk about individual vision for the people of our fellowship and for you, individually. From this springboard, it's aimed at glorifying God, spreading around a good opinion of him to others, one that's accurate. And what we're going to talk about first is what to be in on, the vision, what you specifically to be in on. And then number two, what you are and can do to be in on it, the vision, the vision of glorifying God individually and as a body. That's what we're going to talk about, okay? I want you to know I was so excited with this. This is one of those things where you kind of go, <laughs> and my prayer was, Lord, this is like so rich, and I think I'm going to do so badly at it. Please help me not to do badly. I mean, because, Lord, I mean, okay, yeah, I'm here. I like to have it go well, but, you know, this is really about your glory getting spread around. So please, for you, I don't know. This is what we got. What to be in on. Okay? First of all, we're going to talk about those who are older in our fellowship. Those who are older. And I'm going to put this in biblical terms. This is vision for those who are older from the ground there that he talked about, about the end of all things, this age is at hand, therefore springboard into glorifying God 
Those who are older, and how shall we identify those who are older? Hmm. It is so popular in our culture to um, be called old. Usually those are fighting words. I've felt it. Okay? Old. How should we do it? How about doing it in biblical terms? How about biblical terms? Here's a biblical term. The silver-haired head is a crown of glory. Are you good with that? I'm good with that. The silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way that God says, this is, this is it, this is right, this is the one. So we'll use that classification, older, silver-haired head. Well, what if I cover it up? You know, God knows. We're there, okay? <laughs> That's enough. Silver-haired head. All right? So that's the ones who are older. And I want to cast vision. That's what I'm up to. I want to cast vision. I want to cast vision like this passage gives us the casting vision. Listen to me. Listen to Peter. Listen to God through Peter, through me, to you. The end of everything is at hand. It's not far off. Everything that you know in this age, like it is, the end of it is at hand. Therefore, therefore, based on that, have a degree of control. Have a degree of serious mindedness for the sake of prayer. Vision. Vision. I'm only going to refer to this, but everything that Peter says, Paul says there in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 12. The whole thing that Peter says, Paul says there, because this is where God is casting vision. He says, be fervent in love. He talks about being earnest in prayer. He talks about being given to hospitality. He talks about all those things right there. And listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to Peter through me. Listen to God through Peter through me to you. Prayer is so earnestly needed from you. James, the first pastor of the first church ever in Jerusalem, said this, James 5.16, the earnest prayer of a person right with God accomplishes so much. So much. And how much Unction, strength of life, ability to get out and about. Do we need to enter into earnest prayer? We don't need to drive to Chicago to do it, do we? As a matter of fact, we can do it if we can't even get out of bed someday. And it accomplishes so much, Peter says, or James says. Now you can say, huh, I doubt it. 
You can choose that. But Peter and Paul and James all say different. They all say different. And where does this come from? It comes from the inspired word of the living God. That's where it comes from. I want to give you one other. I'm going to have you look at it. Turn with me just a few books back in the New Testament to James, or excuse me, to Timothy. And I want you to turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes this. Paul has already called himself when he writes this, Paul the Aged. It's what he said in Philemon, verse 9, verse 8 or 9 in there. He says, this comes from Paul the age. Paul wrote that in 60 AD. When he writes this in Timothy, he says it's 66 AD. It's six years into that being Paul the age. When he writes just two years later, he talks about the time of his departure being at hand. The only point I'm making here is that Paul was silver-haired. Paul was older, and he knew it, and he saw it. He saw those things that had changed over time. He felt that in his body physically. He knew what that was. And this is what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, to those who are older and to everyone, he says this, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, first of all, priority of all things, first, number one, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For those who are executors, the kings, and to those who are in high positions, the governors, that, they, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. This is good. This is pleasing. This aligns with God. This is where he is at. This is pleasing in his sight, the sight of God, our Savior. Paul makes that point about prayer. Now, specific vision. Specific vision. Heartland, silver-haired. I want to give you a challenge. Bob's not here. I would give this specifically to Bob and his D-band and to everyone and every D-band who is in this place and that classification. There is a delightful help that has come out on prayer. This is a movie called Ward Room, and I'm not talking about prayer like, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll have dinner. I'm not talking about prayer like that. I'm not talking, that prayer like that is good. It's good right before dinner, and that's where it belongs. We shouldn't delay too long. I've thought of that often for my kids and especially for myself when you're sitting there and you're smelling this. It is not a good time to go into lengthy prayer. Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, sometimes my prayers were two or three sentences, sometimes less, and we ate. I'm talking about war room prayer. I'm talking about getting hold of God and there is prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. I'm talking about taking the needs that are real in people's lives and taking them to the throne of God and staying there on and on and on until God's answer comes clear. I'm talking about throne room prayer. I'm talking about throne room war room prayer. Prayer, because I want you to know to even pray is a war. It's a war. It's a cotton-picking war because all kinds of ideas are going to come into your mind, some from the enemy, to take you away from hanging in there with him to pray. God hears you when you pray. I said that to Daniel. How many have seen this film? War Room. Amen. 
I want you to know, I, I, I saw this film. My wife was down in visiting her parents in the South, and I was there, it was Sunday evening, and got this film out of Red Box. I went home. I was upstairs in our bedroom, laying on the bed, watching this thing. And when she came in, I hid myself. Because this thing, uh, there's one thing here I, you need to let know. I don't like to show my emotions, okay? I, I don't. And if my emotions are gripped, I'll do everything. <sighs> to make it look like it didn't touch me. No man. <laughs> And so when she came in the door, I was sitting there and tears and 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 Oh, you're back, huh? I'm just watching this movie. War Room. And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you not only to see this film, but I want you to challenge you concerning the battle plan. For this, and the statement is from basic training to target strategies in prayer. And I want to challenge the deep ends of the silver hair. I want you in the war room. God wants you in the war room. I want you to be self controlled. I want you to be serious minded to go to the war room for the sake of prayer because we need it. We need it. <sighs> The battle will be won or lost in the war room. And we so need it. This is a volume. And I want the band controlled, self-controlled, and sober-minded and on this. And you say, well, I don't like to read. I have a hard time reading. I know, age. Believe me, my Bible is bigger and my glasses are more amplifying now. But here we've got it on audiobook too. Okay? And I want to put that challenge out before you. 2017, glorifying God for the sake of prayer. Okay, next. Beep. Paul the Age, we heard that. That's what he said. I got a little ahead of myself, I guess. Or a little behind myself, I don't know which. Next group. You ready? For those silver-haired saints, we talked about that. There it is. For those with younger children at home. For those who have younger child, younger children at home. Look at God's wisdom on this. Proverbs 17, 6. Children's children are the crown of old men. And the glory of God, or excuse me, the glory of children is their dad. Does this exclude the mom? Mm -mm. Mom and dad are one. Working together. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. Woman leads the kids. The law of your mother. The glory. Kids. Is the dad. Glorify God, be the glory of 
I can't. Yeah, you know, I, I want you to know this is biblical wisdom. I want you to know I have seen this played out in lives. One of the things that I had to do as a medical administrator, one occasion several years ago, the hospital initiated this. We needed to go to the physicians and talk to the physicians there because we needed to have them come together as a group. And they asked them a questionnaire and they were going to share these answers. And one of the things that they asked was, what was the biggest accomplishment or achievement of your life? And I want you to know, every physician answer, bar none, was their kids. Every one. How many times have you heard, well, my dad, my dad, well, well I'm going to be like my dad. I'm gonna, I've even heard kids who are wanting to be bald because their dad's bald. I'm going to be like my dad because my dad, because the glory of the kid is in their dad. In their mom. How many times? Well, my mom. My mom. Oh, mom. And I got a correction for you here, mom. It's like, mom. From the kid. You know, the kid's going to tell you how you really need to. You know you need to do something with your hair. Mom. Because the glory of the kid in their eyes is the parent, the glorified God. Recognize that. Pick up on that. And you fathers, do not prove them. Do not stir them to agitation, to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture, the structured control and the admonition, the putting it in their mind of the Lord. I want to give you a challenge. If you have younger kids at home, this is vision. 2017 for that group. And I want you to know we are blessed in this church with having a good number of little ones around. Have you noticed that? Oh, I, I know, there's spilled stuff, and there's running around, and there's throwing balls, and all of that stuff, but we are so blessed to have them, and their dad, and their mom, and the challenge is to those dads, and those moms, with those little ones running around, because it is so needed in our generation, the challenge is to shepherd their hearts. The challenge is to go after their heart and what's in their heart. So many kids get bigger but are not brought up. They get older but they're not taken under structured control, nurture, and admonition, putting it into their mind of the Lord. Now, Doc Stewart and I talked about this. We have talked about this and talked about this. Most recently, we talked about it last Friday. And, and the whole thing that comes out is, is how do we do this? Here, I know, let's take mom and dad away from the home on another night so we can teach them how to be at the home. You know, there's something contradictory there. I mean, they're already out enough. And you know what? Doc Stewart and I are not experts on this. God is. God is. So this, this is the challenge. For the D-bands, and by the way, some of those D-bands, listen to me, I'm going to be straight up. But I also want to be gentle. You need to get them together and going. The D-band has a purpose. It's the heartbeat of Heartland. You need to get 
together and get them going. And it doesn't mean when I feel like it or when I don't feel like it. It means we get a plan and work the plan. There are some great helps shepherding a child's heart. My challenge, my vision. Springboarding to love fervently for one another's. To be hospitable to them. To serve with your words and with your actions. My challenge from that ground to the springboard of glorifying God is to work through this and grow through this. We have video on this. We have handbook on this. Not by going to a lecture, but through your D-bands that are already started. Use them. And I want you to know, dads, this book was quite challenging. A Distorted God how your earthly father affects your perception of God and why it matters. I've had many of my kids call me on the phone and say, Amen. <laughs> they said that at the end, talking to me. Amen. I've had this mistake. Lord, I mean, Dad, <laughs> why do you think that is? It's the role. Man, that role is like, phew! Get help with each other. Stimulate one another to love and to good works. And we will put resources for you but it has to be your vision. It has to be your vision. Okay. I need to move along here. I'd love to talk about that more. I love this area so much. Let's talk about this one. For those who are in between. This is the other group. For those who are in between. In between what? In between being fully committed to silver-haired, or having kids at home, you're kind of in between. What do we do? Oh, wow. Serve. Pardon me? Serve. Serve? Amen. Serve how? Turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, Jesus lays out for us a very, 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 very important truth on glorifying God. John chapter 15, verse, 18, or verse 8, I'm not going to go through this whole passage. He just sums it up by this, verse 8. By this is my Father glorified. My Father is glorified. We're springboarding the glory of God. That's what we're to be. That's the chief end. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. This is where we're at here. In between, you have opportunity. The best discipling opportunity are those kids and family that you have. In between, when those kids are gone, and here you're going towards silver hair, you have some, but you're kind of in between yet. I'm asking you to bear more. Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch in me that does bear fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. I'm asking you, I'm casting for you vision to be in on bearing more, much fruit. Much fruit in what? Much fruit in proving, showing, being Christ disciple. 
This proves it, he says, that you're bearing more fruit. I want you to know, quite frankly, some of us in this category have hit the wall. We've hit the wall. We've gone this far, and we have been in on some B band and not in on others. And you know, I just kind of hit and miss. And, and, and some, I'm in my D band thing, but I've hit the wall. I've hit the wall. I'm not going through. Here's what I'm asking you to do go through the wall. Go through the wall. Listen, go through the wall to bear more fruit. Am I talking about more time? No, I'm talking about more specifically focused. Effort to bring up disciples. You know, there's a challenge on this of making disciples. The challenge Apostle Paul gives when he lays out making disciples, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Write this down if you're in between. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be imitators of me, just like I imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. This is what you do to bear more fruit. You go to somebody and you say, here, imitate me in how to handle this. Here, imitate me in Bible time. Imitate me in church fellowship. Imitate me in D-band involvement. Imitate me in leading people to Christ. Imitate me in the prayer life. Do you feel a sense of, whoo, that's a big assignment? You feel that? Go through the wall. Go through the wall. Go through the wall. Grow from where you're at so there's more fruit and you go through the wall. I want to set out a challenge that some of us in between need to be expanding in this disciple-making thing. We need to go forward. You need to repent in your heart and say, God, be, please forgive me for being so about myself and so little about you and go through the wall. We need to ask our praying saints to pray for you to have folks in a D-band, new folks, launching. We need to pray for those D-bands to expand and really gather in people that we sharpen as one iron sharpens another. Okay. Whew. I need to wrap this up. So, what to do to be in on it? Here, let me just give these. Connect to God and others. Changing into Christ's likeness through D-band. Connecting to God and others in our worship, in our assembly. Changing into Christ's likeness through the rub on D-bands. I would show like to just tell you what happened yesterday in the D-band for me as I was there. What a helpful experience. Carrying on Christ's work of service by going through the wall. Now, I want you to know, we have resources for this. And we are putting Heartland resources on this vision of going through the wall. Some of our guys have gone through the wall. It's time to go through the wall. It's time to go through the wall. Okay. By the way, this is the Heartland rhythm. This is when you're a disciple, when you are connecting to God and others, changing into Christ's likeness, carrying on his work of service through debanding, and when you are bringing others around to connect to God and others, to be changing into Christ's likeness through deband, to be carrying on his work of service, the worship, and the debanding. This is the movement of Heartland. There is nothing more. This, this is the vision. This is it. That we bring people and ourselves to go through this and through this with resources. And by the way, so that in everything, boy, this thing really came out messed up today, didn't it? So that in everything,
God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in proving you to be a disciple. Amen.